I'd like to welcome those of you that are just joining us. This is session 266. And this session is going to be a discussion on radioactive iodine therapy, when to use it, how much to use, and radiation safety precautions after therapy. I um, am gonna be personally very interested in hearing all this because I've done had that experience twice. So uh, I would like you to know who our speaker is this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Quack is a nuclear medicine physician at the University of Colorado Hospital in Aurora, Colorado. Dr. Quack also serves as an associate professor of radiology nuclear medicine and the Nuclear Radiology Fellowship Program Director. She earned her undergraduate degree from Dartmouth College and her medical degree from Tufts University School of Medicine in Boston. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over and um, Dr. Quack, the room is yours. Great, thank you so much everybody for joining. Um, it's Dr. Quack, <laughs> it's all good. Well, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Oh boy. I'm it's fine. all good. It's all good. All right. Well, I'm very thankful to Gary Bloom and the rest of the planning committee for inviting me to speak again um, at this great conference. This is actually my third time I'm participating. I'm very excited to be here. Um, so let's get started. All right. So I have no disclosures. And I guess I would subtitle my talk as the who, what, when, where, why, and how of radioactive iodine therapy. I'm gonna answer those questions, but not necessarily in that order. All right, so let's start with the first. So I-131 therapy, what is it? So before I talk about radioactive iodine, first I wanna talk about just iodine in general. So what is iodine? Iodine is an essential nutrient or mineral that we obtain from our diet. And for those of you who've already had your I-131 therapies, you know that everything seems to have iodine in it um, because you have to follow a low iodine diet and it really does restrict your diet. Um, so I have some pictures of here of foods that uh, have a lot of iodine. Those include things like, you know, like some of the leafy greens as well as seafood. Um, if anybody loves sushi, which I do, um, that's gonna have a ton of iodine in it, especially from the kelp. But a lot of the food that we eat actually has iodine in it because we use iodinized salt, actually. Um, but just kind of go, and why do we have iodinized salt? Because the government many, many years ago realized and that iodine is so important in our diet. Um, and so they actually made it so that we actually have iodine within the salt, which allows us to receive our um, daily nutrients. So what we talked about what iodine is, then what is why is iodine so important? Well, the thyroid gland needs the iodine to make thyroid hormone. Um, and really the, the organ in your body that really needs it, it really is the thyroid glands. Um, and we know that thyroid hormone is very important starting at the beginning of life, basically in the womb. The fetus really needs the um, thyroid hormone for you know, a lot of things, but in particular brain development, as well as body growth. So it's super important in the womb. And then once we're out of the womb, um, we, are, we also know that thyroid hormone is really important. It's a big part of the metabolism um, in humans. Um, and it regulates a lot of things that's cardiovascular as well as our, our bones. Um, and so it really is an important hormone that we need um, for our body. So then I'm going to talk about what is I-131. Well, there are many different forms of iodine, um, and I-131 happens to be a radioactive form of iodine. And actually, there are actually several different types of radioactive form of iodine, but I-131 is the one um, that we're going to concentrate on because that's the one we most use, often use um, medically. Um, and radioactive iodine um, is a form of iodine that we can use to actually take pictures or image the thyroid gland as well as the body, and also to treat thyroid disorders, whether benign or malignant. It. So let's talk a little bit about radioactive iodine or I-131 for thyroid cancer. We actually have a lot of history behind that. I-131 has been used to treat thyroid cancer for over 70 years. The very first case that was uh, reported in the um, scientific literature was in 1946 when it was used to treat thyroid cancer in a patient. So it's been a really long time. So we have decades and decades of experience when it comes to using radioactive iodine for thyroid cancer. Now, we can't use radioactive iodine for all thyroid cancers. Uh, of course, you know, it has to be thyroid cancer that actually takes up iodine 
as well as radioactive iodine. And those are going to be the, you know, your classic papillary and follicular thyroid cancers. There are some exceptions such as medullary thyroid cancer, as well as anaplastic thyroid cancer or poorly differentiated thyroid cancers, which don't do a great job of picking up iodine. So radioactive iodine may not be great for those cancers. So we wouldn't typically use radioactive iodine in those patients. Um, I have a picture here actually that I took. Um, this actually is not actually radioactive I-131. This is actually I-123, which is another form of radioactive iodine. Um, and this actually um, um, emits gamma rays. That's really good just for imaging. Um, but I think this is kind of cute. So I actually trained part, uh, part of my training was actually in Dallas, Texas. And in Dallas, Texas, I remember seeing these um, pills and they were uh, blue and silver. And then I get here, and they're green and orange. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. So apparently for fun, some of these radio pharmacies will color these capsules based on like the sports teams, I guess, for that area. So this is for the Broncos right here. Um, radioactive iodine I-131 is usually kind of boring though, unfortunately, they're usually gray pills, but the I-123 can sometimes come in these colorful pills. All right, excuse me, or gel caps. All right, so now that I talked about the what of I-131 therapy, let's, let's talk about who and why, all right. So in order to talk about who needs or who should receive radioactive iodine therapy, the first thing I need to talk about is the ATA or the American Thyroid Association Initial Risk Stratification System. Um, and this is a stratification system um, that the oncologist and endocrinologist use to predict the likelihood of structural disease recurrence after surgery. So what does it mean when we say structural disease? Well, structural disease means that there's actually visible um, tumor that we see, whether it's through ultrasound, MRI, or CT, that we can actually see that there is some sort of recurrence of disease that, uh, that is seen after surgery. Um, there are primary risk factors as well as secondary risk factors um, that are used in this uh, risk stratification system to determine what we think the, uh, a particular patient's risk is of having recurrence of th uh, uh, thyroid cancer um, after uh, thyroidectomy. Um, this is a very long list. I'm not going to go over everything, but I kind of wanted to let you know uh, what the components um, of the risk factor it is that we're looking at uh, when we are using the stratification system. Now, this risk stratification system um, um, is important, and here actually is the actual figure from the um, ATA guidelines. This actually is a figure from the uh, 2015, which is the latest ATA guidelines, but it's actually called the modified 2009 ATA risk stratification. And this shows you kind of, you know, the idea is that this risk, it's not just low, intermediate, high, really, it actually is kind of a spectrum. So you can be low, low to intermediate, intermediate to high and high as well. Um, and these are some of the factors that you saw on that first page that I just showed you that we consider when we are um, deciding whether a patient's risk for um, structural recurrence is going to be low um, all the way up to high risk. And we're going to actually come back um, to this figure because it becomes important when we discuss how much radioactive iodine a patient should receive. So in terms of why we give um, uh, radioactive iodine, or in particular what we're talking about today, I-131, let's talk about what we consider the quote, goals of getting uh, radioactive iodine therapy. Um, you can actually classify those goals um, into three categories. The first category is what we call remnant ablation, and we're going to actually go into detail in the, next, in the next several slides. The second category is something we call adjuvant treatment, and the third category is what we call treatment of known disease. And depending on the patient's um, um, particular situation, a uh, patient will fall into one of these categories, which actually helps us to decide how much radioactive iodine is appropriate for the patient. So let's talk about the first category called remnant ablation. All right, so remnant ablation um, is the very first radioactive iodine therapy a patient will receive, and this is in patients with no known spread of cancer. So these are patients who would be classified as low-risk patients for recurrence. Um, and the goal of this, treat, uh, this category of treatment with radioactive iodine is to ablate or destroy any thyroid tissue, which presume or probably is going to be normal thyroid tissue, because the assumption is, is that with the surgery, we probably removed all the thyroid, uh, thyroid cancer tissue but there may be some you know, normal thyroid tissue left. So we're going to try to get rid of that. And why do we want to do that? Why do we want to get rid of normal thyroid tissue? Well, there's a couple of benefits. And the, uh, the benefit that I want to first talk about is that by getting rid of normal thyroid tissue, it actually can help the physicians uh, monitor the patient um, for the recurrence of thyroid cancer in the future. Um, as many of you guys are probably aware, 
um, thyroglobulin becomes something that thyroid cancer patients become very intimately um, knowledgeable about. Thyroglobulin, you can think about it as a protein or a hormone or something that is made by the thyroid glands, and it's also made by well-differentiated thyroid cancers as well. Um, and once you have a thyroidectomy and you get rid of the thyroid gland, then you really shouldn't have much in the way of a thyroglobulin level. However, I'm always tell patients this, the surgeons are great at taking out the thyroid gland, they'll take out lymph nodes and everything, but there's always microscopic amounts of thyroid tissue that you just cannot see with the naked eye or even with a microscope, I mean, the, the surgical microscope. So anyways, so there's always going to be a little bit of thyroid tissue left in most people, um, and it's presumably going to be normal thyroid tissue. By using the radioactive iodine, we're actually able to have that uh, thyroid tissue take up the iodine, and it'll actually get rid of that uh, normal thyroid tissue. And that can be super helpful because in the future, when physicians want to figure out, you know, you know do a surveillance to make sure there's no recurrence of thyroid cancer, all they have to do is draw blood and look at the thyroid globular levels. Uh, the thyroid globulin levels are drawn, you know, multiple times during the um, perioperative period for treatment of thyroid cancer. You know, it's done before, uh, before surgery, it's done after surgery, and then we continue to monitor that thyroid globulin level. And as you may know, thyroid globulin level can be monitored while you're on the thyroid hormone versus while you're off of it, as well as a stimulated thyroid globulin when you're on the thyroid hormone, but receiving um, Thyrogen as well. So there's a lot of um, uh, things involved, uh, but it's very important to measure the thyroid globulin level to see, you know, if there's any bump, you know, then we know that, okay, there might, it looks like there might be recurrence of thyroid cancer and it actually prompts further workup. And by getting rid of the, uh, any normal thyroid tissue left in the body, we're able to drop that thyroid globulin level as low as possible, close to zero as possible, which makes it much more a sensitive assay in the future for us to detect recurrence of thyroid cancer. The other thing that is what we consider a benefit is, is um, in general, patients should always get what we call a post-therapy scan. And so after you get radioactive iodine, you can come back anywhere between like three to 10 days. For our, uh, for our institution, it's between seven to 10 days. Patients will come back. And by then, a lot of the radioactive iodine is actually gone because most patients are going to be done with their radiation safety precautions by then. But there's just enough iodine left in the body that we can use our special gamma cameras to actually scan the patient's body um, and to see where did the iodine go. So by doing that scan, we're able to potentially detect unknown spread of thyroid cancer to uh, other parts of the body. In general, by looking at the post-operative thyroid globulin levels, we get a general sense of whether a patient may or may not have thyroid cancer that spread to the other bodies by looking at that thyroid globulin level. But occasionally, you know, um, I think in the literature, they say sometimes it's less than 10%, but there's a, a, a percentage of the time where even if the thyroid globulin is low, we can be surprised by the detection of thyroid cancer that spread to other parts of the body, which you can actually see on these post-therapy scans. So that's another benefit. It's a nice kind of an overview of our scan just to make sure that uh, we don't think that our cancer has spread to other parts of the body. Okay, and then let me go to the next slide here. So the next category of a treatment for radioactive iodine is what we would categorize as adjuvant treatment. So what is adjuvant treatment? So adjuvant treatment is going to be radioactive iodine therapy in patients um, who we suspect probably have some microscopic metastatic disease. So in these patients, we may not actually see much on imaging, but looking at their post-operative thyroid globulin levels, as well as looking at the... Um, post-operative um, pathology, looking at the tumor. So, you know, once the tumor gets in taken out, as well as the lymph nodes that get taken out after surgery, the pathologists study it um, and let us know, you know, wh what did the tumor look like? You know, it has to do with the size of the tumor. Did the tumor actually involve any of the, the vessels in the thyroid glands? Um, did it involve any of the lymphatics in the thyroid gland? How many lymph nodes, uh, potentially a thyroid cancer, et cetera? So, in these patients who are, we consider intermediate risk patients, um, in general, you know, we're not seeing anything on our imaging that looks like, okay, there's a like gross disease that, you know, that's clearly seen. But in these patients, we think there might be some microscopic metastatic disease. So by giving radioactive iodine, our goal is going to be to remove any, you know, normal thyroid tissue like the ablation, but also if there's any micrometastatic thyroid cancer disease that's spread already, then it'll go to those areas and treat those areas as well. So that's going to fall under adjuvant, therapy, uh, adjuvant treatment with radioactive iodine. And the benefit in these patients is going to be by getting rid of any microscopic disease that might be left, we want to improve the recurrence-free survival for these patients. 
And then the final category is what we would call treatment of known disease. So I-131 therapy in these patients are going to be in patients where we know that there is a residual tumor, or we know already that there is already spread to other parts of the body. And of course, so these patients are going to be categorized as high-risk patients. And in these patients, they're going to get the higher doses of radioactive iodine. And the goal is going to be to get rid of radioiodine avid local or distant metastatic disease that we know that already exists. Um, in these patients, the benefits are going to be to uh, improve overall prognosis, as well as to potentially by treating these areas, reduce remnant disease or recurrent disease in these patients. So who are patients who may not benefit from um, radioactive iodine um, ablation? Or, um, um, so there are a category of patients where radioactive iodine is not recommended. And these are patients who actually have very small tumors. So if you have a single thyroid cancer that they find in one of the uh, thyroid lobes that's less than or equal to one centimeter, or it could actually be multifocal. And then it happens where sometimes patients have, think, have one, one um, nodule, but then when they actually take out the entire gland and they slice it up and look in the microscope, they realize actually there's multiple foci of tumor, but they happen to be all very, very tiny, like millimeters, right? Less than one centimeter in size. Um, and these patients, um, you know, usually a radioactive iodine ablation, the lowest dose we give is usually not recommended because we don't think that there's going to be great benefit for these patients. But having said that, even if the tumors are less than one centimeter in size, we also want to look at other things, right? We want to see you know, how many lymph nodes potentially had thyroid cancer in them. What was the size of the metastatic deposit in those lymph nodes? We also want to look at the type of pap you know, papillary thyroid cancer that was found. Um, there's different subtypes. And sometimes even if it's a tiny five millimeter cancer, if it's one of the more aggressive forms of papillary thyroid cancer, then we might want to consider doing radioactive iodine instead of not treating that patient. Also, even if it's a tiny tumor, it could potentially extend outside the gland, or we may see under the microscope that the tumor actually involves some of the vessels within the gland. So in those patients, even though the tumor size was small, we would actually consider these patients for ablation treatment versus not treating them with radioactive iodine. Now, are there any patients who should just not receive I-131 therapy? Well, yes, there's uh, two absolute contraindications, and that's going to be patients who are pregnant and patients who are actively lactating or breastfeeding. So in those patients, we do not want to give radioactive iodine. As I mentioned before, the need, the importance of iodine is apparent even in the womb within the babies or the mothers who are pregnant. Uh, the fetus really needs that iodine to grow and develop properly. So we don't want to give any pregnant women radioactive iodine because that could actually destroy the, uh, the thyroid gland um, of the baby. So we wouldn't treat anybody who's pregnant. And, and so those patients would get it you know, after their pregnancy. And we don't want to give radioactive iodine to anybody who's actively breastfeeding. Um, the reason for that is, is remember, iodine is so important and it comes from our diet, right? Your body doesn't make it. You have to actually eat it. And so you can imagine when you have this newborn baby, the baby needs iodine. And where does the baby get the iodine? from the breast milk. And so what happens is that we don't want to, we want to make sure that the baby doesn't get, you know, radioactive iodine that comes out of the breast milk. In addition, um, because the, uh, the, uh, the breastfeeding woman's breast will actually really suck up the iodine, right? Um, you don't want to, you know, expose the lactating breast to a lot of um, radioactive iodine. And so that's why we don't treat people who are actively uh, breastfeeding. Um, so patients who are breastfeeding can be treated, but they have to be like, they have to stop for at least six to eight weeks that are completely dry. Um, and it, it's uh, what we'll discuss is um, and the safety precautions, but those patients for that remainder of the pregnancy for that child would no longer um, breastfeed that child. So those are the two absolute contraindications for radioactive iodine therapy, which would be pregnancy and lactation. Now let's talk about the high, how of I-131 therapy. And, and when I talk about how, actually, I'm going to just talk about what people are really interested in, which is how much radioactive iodine um, should a patient receive. So how much radioactive iodine should we give patients? I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to refer you back to that figure that I showed you earlier um, from the um, 2015 American Thyroid Association guidelines. Remember this risk of structural disease recurrence figure that they had, and I kind of modified it here. So really, the amount of radioactive iodine we give to a patient is going to be based on their risk 
of having recurrent thyroid cancer. So as I talked about in the patients who are going to be candidates for ablation, we're going to use the lowest dose possible. And so that's usually going to be around 30 millicuries, but it can be anywhere from 30 to 50 millicuries that we use for patients when we're considering just ablation treatment. So that's going to be for patients in the low risk category. But you may actually have patients who are in the low to intermediate as well as, well as intermediate risk, risk category. And then those patients will fall under the adjuvant treatment use of radioactive iodine. And the range for that is going to be somewhere between between 50 to 100 millicuries. And once again, whether you get 50 versus 100 is going to depend on, on what risk factors were present um, when we saw the, the pathology and looked at the thyroglobulin levels, et cetera. Um, and finally, uh, the patients who are going to get the, the highest doses of radioactive iodine are going to be patients who have a known disease. As I mentioned, these are patients where we know that the thyroid, you know, sometimes it happens that unfortunately the thyroid tumor may have invaded the uh, laryngeal nerve or adjacent structures, and the surgeon was not able to completely remove it. So we know that there's a visual tumor there. Or in patients where we can see from ultrasound after surgery that they're enlarged suspicious lymph nodes. So we know that they're actually, you know, nodes that are actually involved or potentially we already know that the patient may have a thyroid cancer that spreads to parts of the body like the lungs or the bones. And those patients, we're going to give the much higher doses of the radioactive iodine. Um, and that can range where anywhere from 100 to 150 millicuries for people who have like local regional disease. Usually what that means is an advanced disease like in the neck area um, versus 150 to 200 millicuries for patients who have distant metastatic disease. Having said that, um, I'm not going to go into it in detail in this um, talk today but we sometimes do give much higher doses than 200 millicuries for patients, in which case we may sometimes, we will often use dosimetry um, for those patients to make sure that the amount of radioactive iodine we're giving them is safe. But those are patients um, who either who usually have um, extensive disease that's metastatic or have recurrent disease that's metastatic. Um, most patients will fall into uh, these three categories. In terms of I-131 therapy, let's talk about the, the when and the where question. Um, in terms of when is the radioactive iodine therapy done, of course, it's done after thyroidectomy. Um, it's typically done around three to six months after thyroidectomy. Um, I see people usually get it around six months, but it can be up to a year. Um, where is it done? Most radioactive iodine treatments for thyroid cancer are going to be outpatient procedures. So what that means is the patients will actually come to the hospital or to the clinic where they're treated. Um, and so we'll give them the pills at the hospital or the clinic. But once they receive the pills, they actually go home um, after the therapy and we'll do the safety precautions at home. Uh, we do have um, some patients who do stay as an inpatient get to, their, to do the therapies. And those are patients who are going to be receiving much higher doses of radioactive iodine. I'm talking 200 and up usually. Although some patients who get 200 millicares can actually safely do the safety precautions at home so they can go home. Um, but also some patients are not able to do radiation safety precautions safely at home just because maybe they many people they live with, or they have really young children, or they can't, you know, there's childcare issues, or there, there's life situations, which may prevent them from being able to do safety precautions at home. So those patients will actually re receive inpatient radioactive iodine. But in general, in the U.S., uh, in other countries, a little bit different, but in the U.S., most of our patients are actually treated on an outpatient basis for radioactive iodine therapy. All right, now I'm gonna to go to, I'm gonna switch gears and talk about radiation safety precautions after therapy. Um, and really, when I do these um, consults with our patients before they get the radioactive iodine treatment, really the, the most questions I get is actually about the, the precautions after therapy. Um, so let's discuss this. So why do we have our um, I-131 therapy patients um, follow radiation safety precautions after therapy? treatment. Well, the radioactive iodine uh, the patient is receiving is part of their thyroid cancer treatment. So we're giving the radioactive iodine because we know that it's beneficial to them. But if other people around them become exposed to radiation from the patient, then they don't get any benefit from the radioactive iodine. So we want to decrease other people's exposure as much as possible from the radioactive iodine. So having said that, um, how can people be exposed to radioactive iodine um, from your body once you get radioactive iodine therapy? Well, in order to talk about, uh, think about that, we have to actually talk about the two different types of radiation that is emitted by radioactive iodine. The first is called gamma radiation, and the second one is called beta radiation. The beta radiation is uh, why we use it for therapy. Beta radiation, it doesn't travel very far, a couple of cell diameters, 
but it actually is powerful enough to cause DNA damage of the thyroid cells as well as the thyroid cancer cells, causing these cells to die when they accumulate the radioactive iodines. So the beta radiation is, is what is used for that therapy effect. However, radioactive iodine also has the gamma radiation per, per component Sorry about that. Um, gamma radiation also is also a component of radioactive iodine. And the gamma radiation can actually kill cells or anything like that, but it's great for our gamma camera. So we can actually use that for imaging. And that is used to detect the spread of thyroid cancer to other parts of the body. As I mentioned, um, you know, we always do that post-therapy scan um, in our institution about seven to 10 days after treatment. Um, and it's the gamma radiation component that allows us to actually do that. So the two major ways you could potentially expose people to radiation is gonna be through bodily fluids that may contain beta radiation, as well as the distance precautions because there is some invisible gamma radiation that's coming out of the body um, after treatment. So here I have a picture um, of a patient who, 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 who received um, radioactive iodine. And this kind of gives you, this is a uh, figure actually from the literature, and this gives you an idea of where naturally iodine and radioactive iodine goes to in the body, all right? Um, and that kind of that also explains the main sources of radiation contamination after radioactive iodine therapy. You know, you'll have some in the sweat, tears, because it actually naturally goes to the lacrimal ducts. It's normal for it to go to the salivary glands, and that's why your saliva will have some radioactive iodine. Um, and then also, um, it goes to the liver, and then you'll swallow your saliva, it goes to the stomach, and so it is normal to have uh, some radioactive iodine excreted through your stool, uh, but the main way your body gets rid of any excess you know, iodine or radioactive iodine is going to be through the urine, and so that's why you see um, activity in the kidneys and the ureters as well as in the bladder. Um, so the, the main things that we ask patients to do in terms of radiation safety precautions are going to be uh, salivary Precautions. So the main sources of contamination are going to be saliva, urine, of course, because the urine actually is going to be the most radioactive bodily fluid because that's how your body gets rid of it. Um, and you will also have some in your sweat as well. So saliva, urine, and sweat are the major sources of bodily fluids that we uh, that we ask patients um, to be careful about. But there are other bodily fluids that will have radioactive iodine as well. As discussed before, the breast milk um, and stool will also have it, as well as tears, um, mucus, and blood. But the main things we focus on are going to be saliva, urine, and sweat, because there's going to be the major sources. In addition, as mentioned, we ask patients to do distance precautions um, because of that gamma radiation, the invisible radiation that's coming out of the patient's body. So let's talk about basic radiation safety precautions after I-131 therapy. And the first uh, category I want to talk about is going to be the saliva. So we tell patients no kissing, no sharing food, no sharing utensils or cups or plates. And then patients often ask, well, then can I use disposable utensils, plates, or cups? Um, and we say, um, Probably not, even if it is, you know, compostable and it's better for the earth, okay? We say, uh, we prefer that you use your regular um, utensils um, and cups. The reason for that is, is that if you use um, something that is disposable, let's say the spoon, for example, and you put it in your mouth, once you take it out of your mouth, it's going to have saliva on the spoon, and the saliva may have radioactivity, so now the spoon is radioactive. If you check it into your kitchen trash, it can actually contaminate other things in your trash can with radioactive iodine as well. So we don't want to create radioactive trash if that are possible. And our regulations state that if a patient creates radioactive contaminated trash, they can't just, you know, put it out into the uh, into their driveway for the garbage man to pick up, you know, in a couple of days. You actually have to bag it that radioactive trash up and keep it somewhere on your property for three months while the radiation is dissipating and decaying. And then you can put it out on the curb for the garbage man to pick up. And so we, you know, nobody wants to keep trash around three, four, three months, right? So my recommendation is because you're going to be eating, you know, during your safety precautions, instead of using disposable um, plates and utensils, just use your regular utensils and cups and plates and just make sure it gets washed with warm water and soap or gets, you know, washed, um, you know, with just one cycle of the uh, dishwasher and then it's clean and somebody else can use it. Um, in terms of radioactive iodine, really, you just need a lot of water and a little bit of soap just to kind of uh, wash it off. So the dishwasher, just running it in the dishwasher once should be fine. All right. The other thing that the saliva is going to affect is going to be your toothbrush. Remember, I said 
no kissing, right? Well, we don't want toothbrushes kissing either in the bathroom. And so we say, please keep your toothbrush away from um, other people's toothbrush during your safety precautions. So it's going to have to be this lonely toothbrush here. Um, and I also tell patients, just use like a, you know, throwaway disposable toothbrush. Um, I use one of those like, you know, electronic toothbrushes and each like toothbrush head is like eight bucks or something super expensive, right? So I said, just use like a cheap $2 toothbrush. Uh, but same thing, right? Nobody wants to like, you know, scrub the bristles and take the radiation off afterwards, right? So I say, once you're done with your safety precautions for the amount of days that they tell you to do, I would just take that, put it into like a plastic grocery bag or something you get, you know, from the store and then put it where nobody's going to touch it. And in three months time, we know that the radioactivity has decayed and then you can just chuck it into the regular trash. All right, so in terms of uh, radiation safety precautions, let's talk about the urinary precautions. And as a reminder, remember, the urine actually is going to be the most radioactive bodily fluid uh, for, you know, a couple of days or several days after treatment. So what are the um, safety precautions related to that? We say flush two to three times after using the toilet, whether it's after you urinate or have a bowel movement. I also tell men, please sit when you urinate and do not use urinals to avoid any sort of urinary contamination um, around the toilet. If you can use a separate bathroom for you know, a couple and few days, uh, if possible, that would be ideal, um, but it's not always possible for people, right? So if you have to still share a bathroom, um, then the recommendation is that each time you use the sink or the toilet, make sure you wipe that area. And then also I mentioned sit to urinate. And if there is any sort of urinary contamination, it is very important that it gets cleaned up immediately and whoever does it should wear gloves. And of course, you know, I don't need to tell everybody, make sure you wash your hands really well with water and soap after you use the bathroom. Um, and then once you're done with your precaution days, make sure that the bathroom gets cleaned before anybody else uses it. All right. So let's talk about the radiation safety precautions as, re as it relates to distance precautions. And this is because of the invisible gamma radiation that's going to come out of your body while the radioactive iodine is doing its thing um, in the body. So we tell patients to sleep alone in a separate bed in a separate room. Um, and the amount of days is going to vary. Um, we also say um, keep a distance out of about six feet from others. I like this picture because this is so relevant to us now, right? Like we're still, I guess, in the tail end of the pandemic. And so we're very familiar now, right? With maintaining a six feet distance. So it's kind of interesting because, um, um, you know, during the pandemic and now it's, you know, when I tell patients six feet distance, everybody's cool with that. They know how to do it. We've been doing it. Um, but yeah, the idea is that you want to stay as far away from people as possible. So we say try to maintain a distance of six feet from others. The other thing that's really important about is this, and I mentioned is this, is that um, I tell a patient what this means is actually, it's actually freedom too, right? You don't have to lock yourself up in your basement room or your guest room and never come out and see your family, right? You can still be in the same room with them, just be six feet away. So I say, you know, you can watch a movie um, with your family. Just make sure you're six feet away from them when you're watching that movie, all right? Um, but I do tell patients also sometimes, if you just wanted to get away from your family for a couple of days, you can just not see them either. And that'd be a great excuse as well, all right? And the other thing we mentioned is please stay at home for a few days um, as much as possible. If you have something really emergent and you have to go to the store or something, that's fine. Um, you know, keep that. I usually tell patients, keep that visit very short, maybe like 10, 15 minutes. But if at all possible, we ask them to stay at home because it really is difficult to do these distance precautions, right? When you're out in public, you don't know who's pregnant, all sorts of things. So we want to make sure that you try to stay at home if at all possible. We also say, no public transportation, because you can imagine, you know, if you're in a crowded bus or a train, it's just not, it's not great, right? And people next to you don't know that you got reading divine eyes. So we tell people no public transportation of, for a couple or a few days after treatment. And if you're carpooling, which happens often, you know, patients will come with their significant other or with their children um, to the therapy, it's fine to be in the car with them, but you just want to sit as far away from them as possible. So you've been treated with radic iodine, you're driving, then your family members should sit on the opposite passenger side in the back seat. All right, so let's talk about sweat as one of the major uh, contamination sources after radioactive iodine therapy.
All right, hopefully nobody's sweating like this, right? But um, I tell patients, as long as you're not excessively sweating, unfortunately, this person is excessively sweating, um, you really are not going to contaminate much, all right? So I do tell patients uh, for a couple of days to a few days after treatment, I wouldn't do anything to make yourself sweat a lot, right? So I say, you know, don't, you know, work out or, you know, do anything to like work up a sweat. And as long as you're just, you know, doing your daily activities, then really the main things that the sweat is going to affect are going to be the bed sheets and linens that you use. So we say, you know, don't share it, which makes sense. And it should be easy. So you're just sleeping in a separate bed in a separate room anyways. We also say don't share towels for a couple of days. Use your own towels. And then when you're done with all your safety precautions, um, at the end of that uh, precautionary period, make sure you wash those sheets and linens that you use, the towels and the clothes that you wore before other people handle them. Um, in terms of like, I say, you know, just to be nice, maybe do your laundry separately from somebody else who lives with you uh, that one time, but that actually is a recommendation. People say you don't definitely have to follow, but I just say do that just to be nice. Um, and you don't have to worry about any sort of contamination of radioactive iodine to your washer and dryer. Really, it's a very small amount of radiation. It's a lot of water, and so it all just gets rinsed away. And then let's see. So what are some other safety precautions that we tell patients after radioactive iodine treatment? So we say postpone pregnancy for three, six months after therapy. For men, we usually say, you know, about three months or so. For women, about six or up to 12 months. And the reason for it is this. Actually, you know, a lot of the radioactive iodine is actually, you know, out of your body pretty quickly, but we want to make sure all the radioactive iodine is out. Um, and there's also some not great data, but there is also some limited data that patients may not be as fertile right after treatment. So we want to make sure your body recovers and you're ready to go. And so that's why we recommend about three months for men and about six months for women um, to wait before you try to get pregnant. Um, the other thing we also mentioned, as I mentioned before, stop lactation prior to therapy. And you can't, it's not like a, uh, oh, I'm going to stop the day before, or the week before. No, we have to have the patient stop at least six to eight weeks before just to make sure that the breast is really not making any um, a milk. In addition, um, that child would say stop breastfeeding that child. So the patient, uh, the child will have to switch over to formula. Um, but for any subsequent um, pregnancies, it should not be an issue and breastfeeding that should not be an issue. Um, we also tell patients um, no sexual intercourse. We said no kissing, right, for a couple of days. Sexual intercourse, the data is not great in the literature. And what most people recommend in the literature is about a week or seven days. So that's what I tell my patients. Um, and then as well as limiting the creation of radioactive trash much as possible. Um, if something gets soiled with bodily fluids, mainly the urine, but we also talked about sweat, saliva, blood, feces, maybe even vomit, right, um, which has mucus in it. Um, if it can be washed with water and soap to clean it off, great. If it's something like, you know, toilet paper, if you can just flush it on the toilet, that's great. Um, but if there's something that's created um, that you just can't flush on the toilet and you're not going to be able to wash it off, then you do have to create that separate trash bag where you keep that trash. And once you're done with your safety precautions, you know, you get you bag that up and you put it where no one's going to touch it for three months. and You have to store it on your property and then you can dispose of it um, into the landfill trash. Um, one of the things I did want to mention um, is that um, I live in the state of Colorado, um, but you know, I've lived in Texas and I've lived in Ma uh, Massachusetts and Boston area as well. Um, many landfills actually have radiation detectors. As the trash trucks are coming in, they go through these radiation detectors, and if it detects radiation, it, it, it beeps. Um, and once that happens, it's kind of a big deal. They'll call the, the inspectors from the state, local, um, local state agency that monitors the trash and monitors radioactivity. They'll come out in hazmat suits, and they'll be like digging through the trash to figure out, you know, where is this radiation coming from? You know, mainly because you know, they want to make sure it's not, you know, some sort of bomb or some radio the bomb or something like that, right? Some dirty bomb or something like that, right? But it actually creates a, quite a bit of drama. And our goal is for, you know, our patients not to get caught up in that. Um, and then I did ask before, so what, what's the consequence if, if it if happens? And I was told that 
they will figure out where that trash comes from to their best of their abilities. And if they figure out it came from the patient, um, they may say something like, okay, you cannot, you, know, you can't throw out your trash anymore. You know, no tr trash pickup service for you. Like there can be consequences. So we would just wanna make sure that the patients are aware of this and try to limit that and make sure that they store their trash for three months to make sure all the radioactivity is gone before they dump it into the regular landfill trash. Now, in terms of how long you have to say, uh, you know, follow these radiation safety precautions, as I mentioned, it's going to be variable. For most patients, it's going to be anywhere between three to five days. Um, something that we do at the University of Colorado Hospital that's different than some of the other hospitals I've worked at in the past is that we'll actually have our um, health physicist uh, or medical physicist, they're also called, um, actually call the patient before treatment and we'll talk to them and figure out, you know, their housing situation, like how many people do you live with? Do you have pets? I want to sleep in the bed with you. You know, what is your occupation? Are you around people very cl in close proximity? How many bathrooms do you have, et cetera? So they ask all those questions um, and based on those questions, they'll type it into this like, like very complex, like Excel spreadsheet. Um, and they'll come up with the number of days they know is going to be the minimum number of days that the patients need to follow in order to make sure that they don't expose other people to too much radiation. So we'll do that. So our patients actually have very specific number of days. We say, do this for three days, do this for four days, or do this for five days. We'll actually have very specific um, instructions for the patients based on um, that, those calculations for that patient. But other places may just say, okay, if you're getting 50, you know, I want you to do it for three days. If you're getting 150, I want you to do it for five days. So it's going to be variable. Um, so you want to consult your local I-131 treatment facility to determine okay, how many days do I need to see, uh, follow these radiation safety precautions? And with that, I'm done and we're early. So I have lots of time for questions. Um, Good job. So Good job. That's, that was a great presentation. And you can probably see in the question and answer that we do have a couple of questions. Oh, perfect. Yeah, I'm not sure if Charles Barber is the person that was in our last session. Um, because it's the same question, but if you want, go ahead and answer it again about the safety. Oh, sorry. Can you do me a favor, Becky? I cannot. I'm in the chat box, but I don't uh -huh. see that question. I see. Okay, I can. My read twenty it. minute warning. Okay. Yes. How safe is RAI if you have chronic kidney disease? Oh, that is a very good question. That is a very good question. Yes. Um, and so why that question is relevant is because as I mentioned, what is the main way your body gets the radioactive iodine that it doesn't need to treat the cancer or to get rid of the regular thyroid tissue? Um, it's through the urine. And so if you have chronic kidney disease, that means that things that are, you know, expelled from the body through the urine, it's gonna, it may take longer to get out of the body. So the patients who have kidney disease because of their uh, decreased renal function may be exposed to more radiation because the body's not able to expel it as quickly. So in terms of chronic kidney disease, um, so we'll do modified protocols for these patients, um, depending on the level of their renal dysfunction. Right. Um, and so we'll have to, and so it's going to vary uh, from patient to patient, um, but we have treated patient, a handful of patients who are actually on hemodialysis, right? Um, so these are patients who have non functioning kidneys and they need hemodialysis. And so we'll have special um, procedures for that. And on top of that, there's things like dosimetry that we can do to actually figure out, okay, how long does it take for this patient if they're not on, on hemodialysis to get rid of the radiation iodine from their bodies? And based on that, we can actually tailor the amount of radioactive iodine we give to the patient, because we know that giving 50 in that patient may be the same as giving 75 in another patient, just because it actually lasts in the body longer. But yes, it can be done safely, um, as long as we're aware of it in advance, and we can do things like dosimetry to figure that out. I hope that answers the question. Wonderful. The, this next question is a little longer, and I'll just okay. read it as he wrote it. Um, 2018 thyroidectomy removing four centimeter cancerous nodule lateral lymph node dissection, NTRK3 ETV6 fusion, no RAI, just TSH suppression, TG stable for three plus years at three. Since there are targeted therapies available for this particular fusion, is there still a point to RAI with the risks that come with that as opposed to active monitoring with the option of using a targeted therapy later if the cancer starts growing. I suppose RAI could also be used later if the cancer grows. Is active monitoring and TSH suppression of this intermediate risk cancer appropriate? Um, so 
That's a, that's a really good question as well. So, wow, that's a lot of detail that was put in there. And so I was listening to all of it. Uh, but yes, so remember I showed you, the, I showed everyone that big list of all the primary and secondary risk factors that we look at. And I hear, I heard some of those uh, factors being um, laid out. Um, and it sounds like the ATA risk category that was assigned was intermediate. Um, so in general, for most intermediate risk patients, you know, if, if you um, look at the ATA guidelines from 2015, um, it, it also depends on the, you know, because even though remember it's, it's a spectrum, right? You're not just low, intermediate, or high. There's, it's a spectrum. Um, and so even among that intermediate category, there's a spectrum of patients. And the first couple of patients who are like low to intermediate, um, they actually say you can consider it, which means that it's not recommended, but it's, cons you know, you should consider it. So really it depends on, I guess, um, what the, you know, the physicians who are treating um, you were thinking about, right? And, you know, thinking about, you know, what, you know, the, what the best options were. Um, and I think some of that is going to be institutionally dependent um, in terms of the practice. Um, so, for example, like where at work at the University of Colorado Hospital, pretty much most of our intermediate risk patients get radioactive iodine. They might not get like, you know, 150, but they may get like 50 or 75. Um, and so it says consider according to the ATA guidelines, well, um, where I work, we happen to consider that very often. And so most of the patients do end up getting radioactive iodine. But it sounds like the suppression must be re really working well. The T said suppression must be really working well with the thyroid hormone dosing. Um, and they're able to really track the thyroid globulin levels well. So in that case, you know, if, if that's the case, they've been able to, you know, really suppress the thyroid globulin level with the, um, the thyroid hormone treatment. And, and the uh, and the suppressed TSH, then you know it, that may be a fine option. Um, and it's sure you could do radioactive iodine in the future as well. So yeah, it really is going to be. And that's the thing about um, uh, just cancer therapy in general nowadays. Um, and with uh, radioactive iodine for thyroid cancer is that we have so much information available to us now. Um, especially like oh yeah, you had mentioned that the uh, the fusion and all the so now we actually do genetic profiling for all our tumors right because we know that just because you've got PTC your PTC might not be the same as the, another person's PTC depending on the types of genetic like the DNA mutations that the cancer cells have and so by looking at that they can also figure out your risk categories as well um, and it's true there are some cancer. So in general, we say papillary thyroid cancer is very uh, responsive to radioactive iodine. It's really good at concentrating it. However, uh, they do know from the scientific literature, from the research, that there are certain DNA mutations where even if it's PTC, papillary thyroid cancer, that mutation may make it such that it might not be as good as taking uh, for taking up that radioactive iodine compared to somebody who doesn't have that mutation. So we're getting actually really specific and very tailored treatment these days uh, for all of our cancer patients, including our thyroid cancer patients. So um, it sounds to me that, you know, as long as you're able to, you know, track your thyroid globulin levels really well and do the surveillance and everything's looking good, um, you know, I don't, I wouldn't be nervous that, oh my goodness, you didn't give me ready to buy dying, right? Um, the other thing that sometimes our endocrinologists talk about is, for example, we have some patients, so I'm in Colorado, um, and we're the only major academic center for the entire state of Colorado, and we actually do have patients who come from some, some of the surrounding states, whether it's Montana, Wyoming, Nebraska, some parts of New Mexico, um, and sometimes the, the endocrinologists will see this. They say, you know, I think this patient may not need radioactive iodine, or maybe they, they're going to be like lower ablation dose, but because of where they live and the, um, the medical um, facility and the, um, the options available to them in their remote area, um, if they're living you know, up in the mountains and it's like five, six hours away from Colorado and stuff, or from, uh, from where we are, um, then in, sometimes they'll just do radioactive iodine just, just to kind of hopefully decrease that risk because the surveillance for that patient um, might not be as consistent or, you know, um, or easy to do. Um, and so sometimes it, kind of like the living situation and uh, the, uh, the patient's access to medical resources is also considered uh, when they think about whether they should just monitor the patient or treat them with radioactive iodine as well. Wonderful. We have about 10 minutes left and we have a couple more questions. Okay. So, uh, so the next question says, good afternoon and thank you for sharing your time and expertise. After lobectomy and thyroidectomy in July, I'm trying to choose whether to undergo RAI or not. 
So far, it appears that I'm categorized low risk. Tumor was 1.3 centimeters, no lymph nodes, um, no vascular invasion. Mm -hmm. Endocrinologist did, U did US blood work and said, RAI is a choice in this case, not a must. At 60 years old, is it okay to opt out of RAI? TSH is 2.45, thyroglobulin 1.1 as of August 30th. Is active surveillance more indicated in this case? Okay, so um, yes, so in that case, uh, active surveillance, it, should, it falls in the category, you can definitely do active surveillance, but if you wanted to do radioactive iodine, that's fine as well. So, okay, I'm gonna, my disclaimer here, I'm a nuclear medicine physician who does these radioactive iodine treatments, right? Um, 30 millicuries, so the, the highest amount um, you would get would be 30 millicuries, the lowest that would give any patients with thyroid cancer, the 30 millicuries. And 30 millicuries of radioactive iodine actually is pretty low. And I say it because, for example, um, we use radioactive iodine not just to treat thyroid cancer patients, but we also treat patients who have like Graves disease and, and hyperthyroidism, right, for benign thyroid diseases. And some patients can get up to 30 millicuries for their benign thyroid diseases, right? Um, and we wouldn't be giving really high doses of radioactive iodine in these patients who don't have thyroid cancer, right? So to be honest, 30 millicuries is a pretty low dose of radioactive iodine. Um, and I guess if my family member were in that position with this like kind of low risk, it could be monitored versus getting ready to go act that viodine, I would probably, you know, say, you know, why don't you just get the radioactive iodine? The risks associated with 30 millicuries is so low and the benefits may be much higher than that. So it really wouldn't be a big deal in my, you know, from my medical experience and my knowledge for the person to get the 30. So I, I would tell my family member, I would just get the, the radioactive iodine. But if you didn't, then you still fall in the category of surveillance should be fine. So yeah, you can definitely go either way, but 30 millicuries of radioactive iodine is actually not that much radioactive iodine um, in the scheme of things. And there is no definitive evidence that it is gonna cause cancer in the future or some other, you know, like, you know any salivary gland injury and things like that. So really, I think 30 millicuries, like if it was myself too, I, I would just get the 30 millicuries, but, but um, we have patient autonomy and it really depends on what the patient is comfortable with. So I think either way is fine. Great, great answer. So here's a good one and probably applies to a lot of people out there. Pets, how should we handle pets during radioactive iodine? Um, I kind of understand, I wish, I wish it could be a little bit more specific. Oh, look, pets, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, pets. Like I was thinking pets. So I'm a nuclear medicine physician. So when you say pet, the first thing I'm thinking about is positive trend emission tomography. I'm thinking pets. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> See, this is where my mind is at, right? I'm like, oh, you must be talking about a pet CT scan when in fact you're talking about your your loved ones, your dogs, cats, hamsters, flying squirrel, what have you, right? Okay, all right. Pet That's actually children. Your <laughs> yes, your little furry children. Yes, yes, yes. That's actually a very, very good question. Um, when I do these radiation safety uh, precaution consultations with my patients, I always tell them, treat your pets like your family member. All right. So all the precautions that I talked about with the distance and all of that, do the same thing with your pets. Um, and so um, if you have a pet that loves to snuggle with you, wants to sleep with you in the same room or like right next to you, or wants to sit on your lap at all times, then you will have to make arrangements to make sure that you can do the distance precautions and have the pet sleep in a separate room with somebody else. Um, and so yes, you treat your pets just like the members of your family or the other people that you live with. So you'd wanna make sure you do um, the, uh, the safety precautions that they recommend and follow that with your pets as well. And I can offer from my own experience, that was a problem when I went through it. And um, I had two dogs that absolutely were lap dogs all the time. And I uh, isolated myself in a room upstairs. And you can probably hear my dog in the background. I apologize for that. Um, uh, and I had my brother come over and spend time with them because they couldn't understand why they couldn't be with me. But I did that for a week to make absolutely sure. So very important. Yep. Um, I also want to remind people um, that uh, Dr. Kwok mentioned this in the beginning, but if you have not yet been to the FICA.org website, for those of you that are looking at doing uh, radioactive iodine treatment, there is a wonderful book here about the low iodine diet that tells you everything you need to know and more with lots of wonderful recipes in there. And that will answer a lot of your questions also in, in preparing for your treatment. 
You should check out the FICA website too. So if any of you have not, be sure and go there. So do we have any more questions? Do we have uh, one more? Any suggestions on how to travel for treatment? And we have four minutes left. Oh, that is a very, very good question. Very good question. So uh, yeah, it does get tricky. Um, and in terms of the travel, so one of the things that we do here at the University of Colorado Hospital is that if the patients are traveling from far away, we have to determine how far away is it? Could they get the treatment and travel back? And if so, how many hours is it? And if they're going to be in the car with somebody else, how big is the car? How, you know, how far away can you sit away from that patient or from the other person in the car? And we'll actually do the calculations to figure out whether it's safe or not. Um, there are some patients who travel where they are they're really far away it's like eight hours we know that there's no way um they're going to be able to uh, sit in a car for eight hours with somebody that's going to you know especially if it's a smaller car so in patients um who have to stay at a hotel um, this is our recommendation. I know it, it's troublesome, but you know we don't want to expose the housekeep unknowing housekeeping uh, people who work at these hotels to radiation. So all the radiation safety precautions I talked about with the sheets and the towels and all of that. Um, so what we'll have our patients do is what they'll do is they'll actually bring their own towels and their own sheets, okay? Um, and, and they'll do some preliminary of their own cleaning of the bathroom um, before that leave that hotel, if that's the case where you have to stay at a hotel. Um, and so that's just to make sure that, you know, like I said, you know, you don't want to expose unknowing um, people who work in the hotel industry to radioactive um, iodine. So yes, uh, some of our patients have done that where if they have to, absolutely have to have to stay at a hotel, they'll bring their own sheets, their own towels, and like wipes or something to clean up, you know, um, is before they leave the hotel so that the hotel staff is going to be exposed to something they don't know about. Is there residual radiation that stays in the, the air or on the furniture in the hotel? Well, that's a good question. Um, unless you have excessive amounts of urine, saliva, sweat, which are the major sources of contamination on some sort of surface, that really shouldn't be an issue. And in terms of the air, not really. Okay. So, um, you know, like I said, it's going to be mainly the sheets, the towels, and kind of the surfaces of the, the toilet and the sink that you have to worry about. So you don't really have to worry about that. Same thing in your own home too. Sometimes people get worried, like, can I open my door? Can I open the refrigerator? Can I use my phone? Can I use the remote control on my computer? And I say, yes, you're not going to contaminate those surfaces as long as there's no excessive ur urinary sweat or salivary contamination. So that should be fine. Okay, that's wonderful. All right, um, well, we are coming to the end and I want to thank everyone for joining us and especially thank you, Dr. Kwok, you're awesome and thank lots you. of great information. And um, I also appreciate your sense of humor. So that helps a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Was that funny? I don't know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> exactly. And um, thank you all for being here and I hope to see you in some future sessions. Thank you. Thanks, doctor.